Hello and welcome to House Calls. I'm Vivek Murthy and I have the honor of serving as U.S. Surgeon General. I'd like to introduce you to Kate Bowler, Duke professor and New York Times bestselling author. We believe conversations can be healing. And today we'll be talking about embracing the messiness and imperfection of life. This episode holds truths we all need to hear. Kate, I am so excited for us to have this conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, me me. too. Hello, my friend. It's very (laughs) nice to see your face. It's good to see your face as well. I was thinking before we got on this recording that you and I have actually never met in person uh, before, which seems strange when I thought about it because I feel like I know you even though we've only... I uh, had a few conversations, but one of the things I, I really love about you is you you reminded me how even in just a couple of interactions, you can really come to know someone well, or at least feel like you do and feel very comfortable with them. And that's certainly how I feel uh, with you. And I feel like I've gotten to know you through your voice, which I associate with two qualities, just in, with <laughs> kindness and peace. Those are the, the two things I I feel when I when I hear your voice. So that's I'm so glad so we're doing nice. this together. Ah, well, that it's a, it is a wonderful and strange thing that we can all still feel connected. I, because when I think of you, I always think of connection and all of your work on loneliness and just how mm. much these interactions mean to all of us. So yeah, you're, uh, you're my go-to guy when I always think, why do we all need this so much? What is this craving inside of us to be known and to, to know? And, and strangely, mm. I know an expert about that. It just happens to be the <laughs> Surgeon General. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was uh, speaking of of the strange times that we're in. How have you been during this pandemic? It's been such a tumultuous time for everyone, but what's it been like for you? It's been pretty bumpy, um, in part because I have like health precarity because I have to live with chronic cancer. So that's, I think that's just kind of always um, means that my mind and my heart is on all those of us who who get boxed out in a health Mm. crisis. Um, On the other hand, it's also been a time of tremendous creativity because the second that we Mm. all had to change the way we do everything. So I'm a professor, I had to teach online, I had a podcast, all of a sudden I was never meeting with anyone in person. It became a different way to think about community and love and friendship. And strangely, that has meant that I'm sort of busier and connected in a different way than I was before. So it's been a bit of a mixed bag. Well, it, it sounds like you found some ways to find silver linings in this difficult time. And this is actually one of the reasons I was so excited to talk to you today is because, you know, during these times of uncertainty and pain and loss and grief that many people have experienced over the last two years, I think sometimes these can lead us to darker places, but sometimes miraculously they can help yeah. us find better paths forward. And yeah. There's no one better than you I, I was thinking to talk to you about this because even before the pandemic, you went through an extraordinary and difficult experience where you had to grapple with pain and loss and grief and uncertainty. And yeah. I was wondering if you could if you could tell us about that when you were 35 years old, about uh, the diagnosis you received and about how that affected your life. Yeah, I... It was a very stark before and after in my life. Mm. My before life was I was trying to be a very shiny professor. I had like a very clear plan of the of the illustrious life of a professor that I would lead and with may, my many grateful graduate students. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I really had no, I, there was no dramatic health issue in my family. And so when I was all of a sudden the one with stage four colon cancer and wasn't likely going to survive the year, I really, it really called into question the kind of um, natural optimism that I had about the idea that my life was always going to be the one that works out. And it was certainly the area of my intellectual study because I had written this book on the whole idea of blessed, that like Mm. God will reward you if you have the right kind of faith. And I had sort of adopted a de facto I work hard, I'm reasonably kind, surely I deserve, you know, dot, dot, dot. And and so when I realized I couldn't, I didn't really, that that wasn't the right, that wasn't a framework that was going to guarantee me a single thing, 
and that in mm. life we are promised so little, it really turned my worldview inside out. So I realized my job moving forward was to find a way to live with any kind of meaning and truth and beauty inside of a very uncertain life. So at first, the uncertainty was I, I really only had 60 days to live at a time because I would go in and get scans. And then if it went well, then I would be given the drug for another 60 days. So I, I really only got two month windows, gradually three month, gradually six month. But all of it taught me we don't, we're not guaranteed a future. And it is hard to live that way. But, 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 but if we know that, I think we can be broken open to other people's uncertainty and other people's fear and other mm. people's pain in a way that I don't think I would have if I'd been so sure and so confident that my success was guaranteed. Oh my gosh. I was just thinking when you were talking about living life in 60 day increments, just how excruciating and difficult that must be, especially given that you had a small child at the time, Zach. Yeah. And now Zach is in second grade. Is that right? Yeah. He still have, has like giant flashlight eyes. I feel like 80% <laughs> of the weight of his head is just eyes. Uh, but I think that's partly what felt impossible is, um, is that the more we love, the more it hurts. Hmm. The more we're, we, the more we know that, that people depend on us and there are lives that there are people who can't live without us. And I think uh, it means that I can't just be like a, a hopeful person or an optimistic person. I have to be someone who knows how to grapple with fear. Because the second I look at him, I feel both things, like a love that feels like it's going to explode my heart and, and also like a fear that I might not always get to be the person that, that makes his life fun or beautiful. Mm. My gosh, it... Uh, it's it, it's on the one hand heartbreaking and also inspiring to hear you say that because I'm thinking about this as a dad myself. I have two small kids. Uh, they're five and four. And my wife rightly accuses me of being an overprotective parent. I'm very <laughs> attached to my kids. Um, but, you know, I had a health scare, you know, some time ago, not nothing near the extent of uh, uh, what you experienced. But even that mild scare, like the I just remember the thoughts flashing through my head of not being there for my children when they grew up. And it it, it felt like it would break me. I mean, it was just, I, I didn't, it was painful in a way that I hadn't really experienced before um, and just truly wrenching. And you somehow managed, I don't know how you did, but you somehow navigated these extraordinary many, many months of uncertainty, uh, not knowing if, you know, taking them, the, the treatment was actually going to result in a better outcome and give you another 60 days of life and this time with your family. How did you navigate that uncertainty? Like, where did you find your strength? Well, maybe, I guess I kind of had to give up on strength as my primary, as my primary paradigm. Because I, um, you know, I am uh, not American, but I am, you know, I'm Canadian and so Canadian that I just want to bring it up right away, you know, how they are. Um, <laughs> but I, yet I have such a de facto American set of beliefs that, you know, in the power of the individual and bootstrappings and, you know, going, going it on my own. And that was probably the first thing that had to go was mm. if I'm going to do this right, trying to figure out what right is, I'm going to have to learn how to be carried I'm going to mm. have to learn how to f let my weight be be held by other people. Weirdly, that was things like um, learning how to be delightable. Like when you're, you know, you know, when there's, you're just, your life is full of unfixable problems and nobody really knows how to fix your, you know, help you. And the truth is they can't, like they can't, I don't have a lab, you know, in the, in the back of my house with which to concoct life-saving drugs. <laughs> like there's so few things we can do for each other, but learning how to, how to be, um, to find the joys that count. For me, it was like gummy worms, dumb flavors of potato chips, hmm. uh, having just the friends that drive you to enormous statues. Like I went to the world's largest outdoor fryer, which is conveniently really? located near Durham, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, finding, finding ways that joy could interrupt the monotony of pain. Hmm. Um, 
but also just um, finding a way to feel useful again. And I think that's it's something I experienced in the feeling of calling that like sometimes our work makes us feel valuable and I don't know, useful when everything disposable about your body and your illness makes you feel useless. So I, I did some writing, I made podcasts, I did things that helped me feel like I could use gifts that I could dig out from inside of myself. And that gave me a sense of dignity that kind of very quickly went away the second that I felt sick. So Hmm. work and delight and realizing I would need a much better account of interdependence were kind of the ways that I made it through those first couple, those first couple years. Wow. It sounds like, it sounds like you had to change or rethink perhaps how you define strength in a sense. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, I would always prefer to do things on my own Mm. and to be the giver and not the receiver. It made me feel a little ridiculous. Like when you have to get carried to the bathroom or, you know, you can't really eat the thing they put on your plate or like all the neediness, it felt terrible. It felt like I was kind of using up all of my, like the goodwill of the people who love Mm. me. And, and when you realize you might not be able to like pay everybody back, you know, and even up the invisible Mm -hmm. ledgers. Uh, I think that pushed me into a different account of what love is. Like there's not going to be good math on this. And sometimes even when other people are the ones that are the givers or they feel like, you know, you feel like everybody else is giving you way more than you can give them. That is one of the weirdest things about love is sometimes um, like, like <laughs> it's a bad comparison, but when we have like a dog or like a something we love that's a dependent, we love them as they need us. And that's something mm-hmm. I think all caretakers feel is dependence isn't just a burden. It feels good to love mm-hmm. others. So I needed to learn that people actually, when they could bring the special grippy socks for when I was in the hospital or, you know, or like share a stupid Netflix show that actually it was making us closer than we would be if I just pretended to do it by myself. Hmm. That interdependence that you're referring to that it's so powerful and so tightly connected with love. And uh, I'm resonating with what you said in the beginning, which is that there's something in modern culture, which makes us feel that we are weak. If we are interdependent, we somehow rely on others for anything, whether it's our, our entertainment, our sustenance, our security and safety. But that's just how we are. It feels like an acknowledgement of reality and nature to recognize that interdependence is the nature of humanity and not some sign that we're somehow not enough, you know? Yeah, it's not like a failure or an aberration. We're like built that way. (laughs) Fragile at the beginning, fragile at the end, (laughs) just wonky in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I think about... um, about Zach, actually, I've been as I've been thinking about this interview, I've been he's been on my mind a lot. And can I just ask you, how is he doing? Yeah, he's he's great. Um, I think honestly, he's kind of my biggest um, reminder. Which honestly, it feels kind of like a miracle when I see him. Mm-hmm. He seems so um, untouched by how oh. awful it's been, and I know when I look at him that that's not because of me. Like, I mean, Mm. I did a pretty good job of being knowable and like, you know, like keeping the gates open so that even when things were hard, it was, we could always be close. But when, when I really couldn't, I couldn't pick him up because of surgical incisions. I couldn't, I mean, I had chemo packs on layers of other chemo packs. I mean, I was, it was hard to be the mom that I wanted to be. So when I look at how hilariously confident he is that everyone in his life loves him the wild and inappropriate self-esteem that only an eight-year-old can have (laughs) i realize like he's my perfect example of what a group project Mm. looks like like because we had people in and out we've had um family and friends we were not an island that that honestly that reminds me so much of your work like we really when we feel fragile, like the worst version is then that we try to accept loneliness as our burden. And so when I when I see him, I was like, oh, that that kid had a lot. That that kid was not on an island. 
and that's why uh and that's why he he doesn't believe that life is something you have to do by yourself that's so powerful what you just said there and i feel so happy to know that he had it sounds like a village to support him uh, yeah. especially during your toughest times with your health you know, if i think about the pandemic and what's been happening to use your analogy of being on an island it, a lot of people do feel yeah. like they've been on an island during these last two years and i think about parents a lot during this pandemic because parenting wasn't easy before the pandemic by any stretch in modern society but I feel like it's gotten really tough, even tougher for many parents during this pandemic. And part of the reason, not not even just having to navigate how to get your kid to school safely, you know, with everything happening with the virus, how to manage your work, how to telework, homeschool when you need to, all this kind of stuff. But even above and beyond all of that, it's not having all of the supports around you yes. that many people had uh, before the pandemic. And what I'm curious about is is how, when you think about parenting now, when you think about the importance of that village, like uh, how have you like built your life uh, for you and your husband for Zach and in, in a way that you you have that village? And I'm curious if you have advice for the rest of us out there who are parents trying to figure out how to how to build that village or how to make choices that'll give our kids that kind of support. Like how yeah. should people think about these decisions right now? Because I, I think as tough as a time of this as this is, it may be a way an opportunity for us to pivot in a new direction yeah yes yeah because especially during the first long stretch of the pandemic before vaccinations for kids it was i mean the the health precarity that everyone was experiencing the then um the remote learning i'm zach like most kids i know are is is behind and it, and and watching him get stability from an in um, in person classroom this year has been such a wonderful reminder that it's not just our our family and we're our friends that we need. It's our teachers and our reading specialists and you know this incredible community of experts that we get when we when we have the the joy of being plugged out back into a larger community. And I. It's been, um, there's almost like a, you go through a long stretch of survivalism where you do the best you can strip down to the studs. Hmm. Um, and I know all of us are constantly making adjudications about what other supports we can afford to have based on the health situation of our families. But it has really reminded me that one, I was never going to be able to be a great first and second grade teacher. <laughs> On my own, <laughs> and that, um, and that, um, and that the support of others is integral to the development of my kid, um, and also that like a progress narrative, this you can do anything, is also just not realistic. Like mm -hmm. we're trying to make up for things we've lost, and it's okay to say that we've lost them. It helps mm -hmm. us be realistic and then face those gaps with courage. But it also then, if we admit them, doesn't force us back into that kind of collapsing embarrassment narrative that like, that it's, it's, this is not the situation we would have chosen. We will, we will accept reality with <laughs> love and openness, but man, we, um, none of us really were going to be able to, um, I mean, unless you're just a fabulous little house in the prairie homesteader, like I, <laughs> with me at the piano. I mean, <laughs> it is it has been rough days for parenting, and and to me, the 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 light at the end of every tunnel has always been um, that other people will come to the rescue. Hmm. Oh, that is so beautifully put. You know, I think one of the other things that's been tough about parenting during this pandemic has been realizing for many people that maybe some of the things that we worried about before maybe don't matter as yeah. much and trying to figure out like how to recalibrate <laughs> totally. uh, and focus on the stuff that does matter. Uh, but when you think about your own life, both not just through the uh, the health care that you went through, but also this pandemic, like how is your measure of your life changed in terms yeah. of what's meaningful, what's worth pursuing? I guess... Uh the first thing that comes to mind was related to the 
kind of parenting prosperity gospel. It was the idea that um, as a middle class person, that it is my job to create basically an extended finishing school for my child who will have just a wide assortment of personality enhancing hobbies. And, you know, when I look at what like a good life means, when I look at my um, kid and the other kids in my life that I get to help raise, like I, I, I can, if it really feels like the, the, the barometer for what success is, has really changed for me. It's like, are mm-hmm. they, do they have a sense of, of, of goodness and equilibrium with other people's feelings and needs? Um, are, are they uh, creative and not on screens 24 hours a day? Are they, I mean, it's been really nice to give up um, the sense that my worth as a mom is somehow tied to whether, you know, little Johnny is really crushing it at soccer lately. So it has to help me give up like a parenting prosperity gospel, the idea that I need to, you know, he needs to win uh, in this culture. I think it's also I, I, the thing that I felt most acutely with being sick was that, okay, well, my life is going to be a chronic condition. Hmm. But now with what we've all been carrying as a culture, I think that's it's given me that that broader sense, like, yes, like our, our lives are a chronic condition. We are not, hmm. we don't, are, we're not given a promised future. I'm obsessed with being the person that always makes the fun plan and, oh, next summer we should. And we all find that our plans continue to come undone, but then we have to remake them. So I, I guess lately it feels like success is that I am constantly replenishing my hopes. I'm constantly hmm. putting a beautiful thing in front of me that I have to work for, but doesn't burden me. Something that makes me right size my loves to my fears in my life. But then also that I can be the kind of person that looks to the past, great things that have happened, like the miracle of an untouched kid. And I get to say like, thank God that is already mine, Hmm. you know? So that, it helps, it helps when I know that there isn't a, there's there's just no there's no straight path anymore, but but there can still be enough beautiful things. You know that's actually I think related to this this topic I think about with especially with uh, you know as we try to raise our kids uh, and not totally screwed up uh, my wife and I but, uh, <laughs> she's doing a great job I worry about me sometimes but the, <laughs> this whole question around ambition yeah. and how to think about ambition how to cultivate it but in the right way. Of yeah. our children, um, that's something I find myself grappling with. Can you help me? How should I mm. think about mm. uh, ambition and how to teach our? How do we teach our kids about healthy ambition? Oh, and what to I, center it around? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna try something, and then I, you're gonna tell me if it sounds right because it's just been something I've been really, I guess, like fussing over. Is hmm. there's a There's a thing I learned to do as someone who just was working really hard in one area. Like, my, I always wanted to be a historian. I just loved doing like, <laughs> archives and databases. And, you know, I just like, I loved my particular thing. Um, but then when I got really sick and I, ha- I kept having to rebuild after, you know, the diagnosis or after a surgery, like, I'd, I'd mm. kind of have to start from scratch with my body and my life and what I was able to do. I really feel the value of of learning to try, like like just being able to have a clear view of the of your resources of the day, the week, the month, and say like what is possible today, hmm. and like not and give up that everything is possible because that is just a just a beautiful American heresy, and we're just gonna let it go. <laughs> And, uh, and and we are not going to slide into nothing is possible because that therein lies despair. And also, um, it is not true. We are built to try. But uh, but finding that kind of like point of uh, traction is a is a thing that I uh, I mean I love to watch it in other people. I'm the kind of person that cries at a gym when I see a woman do a pull up. <laughs> I was like, it's so hard, <laughs> you know. But like that to me is the thing I want to try without breaking the paradigm. So I want to teach him to learn the joy of trying Hmm. without saddling him with the weight of perfectionism. 
Yes. And I think that's got to be really hard, right? Yes, it is really hard, especially that perfectionism piece, which is why and that's the question is how to how can we encourage our kids to to strive and to thrive without being constrained and shackled by some arbitrary or external metric? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because we're made, we're like transformed in the trying. Yes. That's right. I, I, I struggle. I mean, I've one of the just most mundane little microcosms for this is like, hey, child of mine, would you like to have an enriching hobby? Of course, these things will also <laughs> go into college application, but would you really appreciate? So I was like, Zach, you're going to love to play cello now. Here's a cello. I play cello. Now we play cello, right? It's just, it's terrible and absolutely transparent. And I was like, Zach, wouldn't it be so nice for you to have this hobby that you can enjoy your whole life? And he puts his little hand on my shoulder and he says, with so much disappointment, he goes, oh, mom, but I love to pick up sticks and I could do that my whole life. <laughs> and I'm just like, ah, like, I hear you. Yes, appreciate the moment. But I, I'm trying to always find a staging ground to let them practice making progress, learning more about themselves, developing those habits of resilience hmm. without them putting them into the exhausting, overachieving super train of um, where they're chasing a future that that might not always be you know they might change the world might change we know that adaptability is is like what we're all learning right now how do we live how do we teach them to live with precarity and at the same time want to build skills that last hmm. that seems like a fine line to land this <laughs> on and it's interesting because as much as the world is changing and will continue to change kid it seems like, and you, you and I have talked about this in the past, that one thing that doesn't seem like it's changed over the generations is the fulfillment that we get from deeply meaningful relationships with one yeah. another. Yeah. And I find myself thinking about that a lot with regard to my kids, like how to give them a foundation for building healthy, loving, honest, open relationships. Uh, it doesn't have to be with hundreds of people. It could just be with a couple of people who are close yeah. friends, family members, but... Gosh, I so wish that for them. You said you had the find your three, right? You said find your three people. Oh, gosh, you have a very good memory, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love I love your stuff. I think it was so when you said that it was so reasonable. You said you don't have to have a million friends, um, but 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 go through the process of trying to find your three and I. I, uh, I've asked a number of people that, like if they can name their three. And I found especially with, um, with men, frankly, in their, in their 30s and 40s, that they had, there had been a lot of attrition in friendships and that they hadn't, yes. that it was hard for them to name mm -hmm. three. But what a beautiful opportunity to say, well, if there's a spot open, like, great, auditions, auditions are happening now. Everyone <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I love that. I love that. You know, Kate, I, I want to also just, I want to think about talk about your book for a moment. Um, you've had several, but most recently, the one entitled "No Cure for Being Human," and I got to say, first, I love that title. <laughs> uh, I think it's it's both whimsical, but it's so deep and profound in terms of the the message behind it. But hmm. tell us a little bit about that title and what what you were thinking of, because I believe there's a powerful, deeper message behind it. I guess. Um... When I was really sick, I started to wonder if my problem was time, like whether I just, you know, I don't have enough of it. Is there a way to make my um, life more meaningful with bucket lists? And I found myself kind of ramping up to try to solve the problem of a limited life. And then I realized that what I was doing was probably like the worst forms of <laughs> of neoliberalism and late stage capitalism, which is we make ourselves a problem that we're going to solve. And hmm. I, I thought that that my finitude, my just creatureliness and limitations in humanity was the problem. Hmm. And once I started really also, I'm just so great at parties. Where I'm like, well, there's no cure to being human. Um, I realized that 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 if I accept that this is our this is the core of what it is 
to be a person, to be in this body, in this life, in this room, then maybe my job then is not to solve that like a problem, but to, mm-hmm. to learn to find the richness and the beauty and the truth of it without trying to escape it. And, and that made me feel, uh, frankly, less kind of claustrophobic about a body that breaks down and about a pandemic I can't change and about the feeling of constriction but just enough to kind of give me the the space to like push the walls out as much as I can um, and to live my life like this without the embarrassment that I felt when I was first, you know, the person that couldn't fix their life, you know, the tragedy. It gives me a different paradigm to be a human again today. Hmm. It's so powerful what you just said about the shame you felt and not being able to fix your life. And on, you know, looking at it objectively, you had a serious illness and nobody would have expected that you would be able to solve stage four colon cancer on your own. Oh, they did though. Oh, they did. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Did you? So I, I wrote an op-ed for the New York times and I forgot to take my email off the bottom. I don't know why. And I got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of mail of people explaining to me how to solve my own colon cancer diagnosis. So, oh my gosh! Faith, <laughs> oh my gosh! Faith, I'm so sorry to hear that. Could I try faithfulness smoothies? I mean, from secular to religious hmm. arguments, and also with colon cancer, it, it opens itself up to critiques about whether about my diet or. But hmm. I immediately received the message that I that I really just oh needed gosh. to learn to try, and so abandoning the you can always fix it. And then trying to find those points of um, agency, but not unlimited agency was like, that was to me the hardest part of that first year. Oh my God. I cannot believe you received all of those messages. Wow. (laughs) It's always like, thanks Gary from Indiana. It's always good to know my faithfulness. The (laughs) faithlessness is is murdering me. And surely God God is a just God to let me die. Thanks Gary. I'm so sorry that you experienced that, especially at that moment to receive those kind of messages. Oh, I can't even imagine how that would feel. Yeah, but you know, the thing that I find striking about what you're saying also is that this sort of shame that we feel and not being problem solvers for every challenge that comes into our life, I think is a, it really hits at the heart of, I think, what might be wrong in part with how we see ourselves in society is like having yeah. to solve every problem. And, uh, and there's a, and, and there was a teacher I like who, who once used to say that in life, in modern life, we have skewed in, in our balance from both being and doing to solely doing. We focus mm-hmm. less on being, uh, mm-hmm. less on, and I think of being as observing, experiencing, appreciating, witnessing, um, processing and understanding um, as opposed to doing, which is much more action oriented, trying to figure out, okay, how to line up the five specialists who are going to take care of this problem and identify the five tools that I need and the right yeah. timetable, et cetera. And you got to have a balance of both, obviously, but it does feel like we are so focused on action that sometimes um, those people in society, including our children who may be more inclined to observe and to appreciate and to be in the moment. Um, sometimes I think those that's its own superpower and it goes underappreciated. Can I ask you, I know our time is coming to a close, Kate, but I would be remiss if I, remiss if I didn't ask you about your about faith. And you obviously faith is such an important part of your professional life and it's been part of your uh, life from the early, your earliest years. But I, I wonder, the experience that you went through how did it impact your own personal faith? I I would be lying if I didn't say I wasn't very angry um, at first, especially when I felt like I I had, you know, it's like you know, these are all the things you're not supposed to say as a Christian, where you're like, I deserve I deserve a great life, or you know, I was a good Christian, mm-hmm. but um, I, you know, I worked at a divinity school. <laughs> I cared about people spiritually. Uh, I felt I felt an outrage that um, 
I had to reconcile with my expectations for what the world, whether the world was supposed to bend to my experience of it. And, um, but simultaneously, I also experienced such a sense of tremendous love that it, uh, that never really went away it is once I am, once I couldn't care for myself and this, I was going to have to need a whole community to carry my life and my family's life forward. I knew something then about the love of community that I <laughs> had preferred not to learn before. And that taught me a lot about church and about um, mm. the way we are meant to love our neighbors. And I, uh, but I, I guess the, the intense sense of being like valuable in a system where, you know, you're always wearing a rough cotton gown and you have to give up your body so fast and to feel like so loved all the time by God and by other people really did, uh, it really did change um, my sense of like what we're for, I guess, as people. Mm. So it helped because then, then all of a sudden it was very weird because it just, it was like a matrix feeling. Like once you can see your own undoing, you can sort of see the fragility of everybody else's. And then I felt like I just couldn't unsee it. And that made me feel like I belonged to everybody and all of their mess, too. So that was um, one of the most transforming experiences in my life. But, yeah, it went from a real rage fest <laughs> to, mm. uh, to a sense of, like, pretty consuming love. That's incredible. I just want to say that. I mean, that is mm. absolutely incredible. I mean, one of the reasons that I so love and admire you is because Aww. you have, despite all the pain you've been through, all the hardship, also despite all the uncertainty that you've had to contend with in your life, you still have found a way to center your life on love mm -hmm. and to find a way to somehow transform this experience into greater empathy for other people and their experiences. and. Oh, it's just well, so thank beautiful. you friend that's so oh nice. it's true i mean I, it's not just you nice. saying it i i hear it when you're in the conversations you have with others i i read it in the the words that you write in your books it's coming from such a deep and genuine place but it's that kind of empathy and that sort of love that i i feel we need more of in the world that's what will help us heal and you just have that in spades and so oh, i'm so great, you, grateful you for sharing that with <laughs> all of us that's so nice Thank you. That's true. Thanks. Because when I uh, when I see you, I see someone who made love into service right away. So uh, mm. that does not go unnoticed. You're thank like, you. it's it's a really lovely thing to see up close. And thank you. That means a lot to me. Kate, you know, as we close, I'm going to ask you one, one fun thing. And then I'm going to ask you if you'll actually close our conversation with a blessing, which is something sure. I love that you do on, uh, on social media. Um, but one of the things I love about you is also your laugh. I mean, you found a way to find humor and, uh, and to bring laughter to incredibly serious and challenging topics, which I, which I so admire. Um, but when's the time that you, when's the last time that you laughed uncontrollably? Um, yeah. Um, my kid was pretending to do magic, uh, after he'd seen the Harry Potter invisibility cloak. Uh -huh. And um, he, I looked over and he was holding, uh, he was wearing clothes and he was like, ooh, you don't see me. And I was like, okay. And I look over again, he's not wearing a shirt. And he's like, ooh, you only see pants. And I was like, okay. I look over, he's completely naked holding an enormous <laughs> bag of chips that I told him he couldn't eat. He's like, ooh, you only see chips I'm going to eat. And then like ran sprinting away as fast as he could. And like the way he committed to nudity in a long form joke where he, I, was, I was like, you are my, you are my my son in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> I was very impressed. <laughs> oh my gosh. Seeing your child naked running around the house eating chips, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and so he had an invisibility cloak on. It was, it was really, uh, really, really powerful how he worked that out. I'm glad he uh, decided to road test it at home. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <public. laughs> he did, exactly. I'll get a call from college. Your son. 
<laughs> Keeps bringing out that invisibility cloak, <laughs> disturbing the neighbors. <laughs> well, Kate, one of the things you do on social media, which I love, is that you often offer uh, a blessing uh, to the public. And I would love if you could close our conversation with the blessing as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. Part of, I love um, I love that we can just like bless the crap out of each other. And I I, I love to make fun of um, sort of slogans that don't help anymore, like carpe diem. And so we just started saying crap, crap, ADM. Like we will just seize the garbage of our lives and we will bless. We will bless all that we can bless. So I picked um, a blessing for when there's no cure for being mm. human, if that's all right. Yes. Okay. It's beautiful. God, I feel it again, the burden of being human and the fact that nothing will exempt us from the pain of it. Blessed are we, your human creatures, with mind and soul and spirit bounded in flesh and bone, struggling in this seeming conspiracy against progress, against the perfection that our minds can grasp and our hearts long for. God, how we yearn for the completion of all things, and we try, oh, how we try, to hurry it along with our self-help elixirs, slurries with the touch of truth and a handful of goodness enough to be effective for a while the gospel of hustle or of positivity or peloton but then life happens and we realize all over again that we are human frail and finite and that there's no cure for that despite illusory promises that say otherwise this is where we live in this reality come help us in our humanity Help us enjoy all the beauty that is here, the sweetness that comes to us unbidden, the light that gives us eyes to see. It's not all up to us. Thank heaven. Thanks for joining this conversation with Kate Bowler. Join me for the next episode of House Calls with Dr. Vivek Murthy. Wishing you all health and happiness.